Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everybody from the three ITU regions, and welcome to the third episode of the ITU satellite webinars. Probably most of you, because we have seen the list, have been participating and following us during the previous ITU satellite webinars. The first one dedicated to interference with the satellite systems, and the second one to non-GSO. And today, we have the pleasure to keep you uh, tuned with the ITU uh, regulations and satellite innovation. And for that, we will count with the expert from the GSO community, which will give us a nice uh, introduction and comprehensive information about, uh, as you said, uh, satellite regulations and innovation. So they will be dedicated to GSO satellite system from high throughput satellites or high capacity satellites to mobility, and also to give us a nice uh, insights of the WRC 19 outcomes and WRC 23 study cycles in the related issues. Uh, we will count with the uh, director of the Radio Communication Bureau as well in the opening remarks and with uh, Mr. Nelson Malaguti, who is a counselor of study groups uh, for, for satellite issues. Uh, before to go to the uh, uh, opening, let me give the usual technical announcements, which are that this meeting is going to be, is, is being recorded and it will be also post in the ITU and YouTube for further consultation, as many of the previous uh, YouTubes and the videos. Uh, we are going to post some polls, some, some questions, so we can get uh, your views on different issues concerning GSO. And uh, we'll share it at the end of the session. And please use the chat session for any problem with the connectivity and the Q&A for the questions addressed to the panelists. So now let me give the, the floor to Mr. Mario Maniewicz, the director of the Radio Communication Bureau. Director, please. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Jorge. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to our distinguished speakers, as well as to the participants who are joining this ITUR webinar from around the world. Over the past two months, we have hosted two episodes of, uh, of our series of webinars on satellite-related aspects which were dedicated to preventing interface to satellite systems and to non-GSO large constellations for broadband applications. For each of those episodes, we counted with distinguished speakers from the space sector and an impressive audience, the passing 500, 1,500 participants who connected uh, from different media platforms from more than 120 countries. I have noted with great pleasure that participants from industry and universities come equally from members and non-members of the ITU. And I hope that these webinars may convince non-members to have a closer look at the opportunities offered by an ITU membership. We are eager to welcome you to the ITU family very soon. Today, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this third episode in the series of ITU satellite webinars, this time dedicated to GSO satellite systems. As you will know, geostationary satellites have a long history from the first GSO satellites launched over the Atlantic in the 60s for interoceanic telecommunications until today, when they are used for internet access, broadcasting, mobility, backhaul of telecommunication networks, emergency communications, and meteorological purposes, reaching every single populated corner of the world. Certainly, the resilience and broad coverage are playing an important role to achieve our goal to connect the 3.8 billion people without access to the internet today. The latest World Radio Communication Conference, WRC 19, took a number of decisions to improve the regulatory procedures for GSO satellites so that administrations are better positioned when coordinating, licensing, or operating earth stations in motion with the objective to enable broadband connectivity to citizens on board of ships, aircraft, and land vehicles, as well as to ensure their safety and security. Also, the conference resolved to study possible additional resources for air stations in motion in the KU band. In preparation for WRC 23, studies are not limited to space to earth or earth to space links. The second meeting of ITU study group four and its working parties that ended last week is evaluating ways to improve space to space communications, including with GSO satellites so that the growing demand of traffic can be absorbed by using intersatellite links and improving the efficiency in sharing the spectrum. In summary, GSO satellite systems have both a long history and a bright future with the innovation in technologies that the industry is bringing, as we'll see today in these webinars. 
Dear friends, we are proud to count on distinguished experts and organizations supporting these webinars and you as our valuable audience. Once again, I invite you to enjoy the webinar, participate actively in it, and more importantly, to apply the concepts that you will learn to assure that more and more citizens will have access to solid telecommunications and innovative services around the world. Have a nice webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Director. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good day to all of you. Thank you very much for all the, those that are attending this uh, this uh, webinar. Um, so, in order to introduce um, the, uh, or let's say, to set the frame of the discussions we are going to have with our distinguished panelists, I uh, would just like to uh, make a brief uh, presentation here um, on some uh, relevant results of WRC-19 regarding the uh, geostationary satellites and also just briefly touch some uh, of the agenda items of the next conference, WRC-23, on this issue. So I'm just going to share my screen. So, thank you very much. Sorry for this technical problem here. So, um, as I was saying, um, you can see here uh, in this slide the uh, two main uh, decisions uh, uh, that were taken by WRC, our last conference uh, in Sharm el Sheikh in Egypt, WRC 19, which are related to uh, geostationary broadband uh, satellite networks. So, the first uh, decision was uh, related to the use of the frequency bands 17.7 and 19.7 gigahertz in the space to Earth direction and 27.5 to 29.5 gigahertz in the Earth to space direction by Earth stations in motion, what we call uh, in short eSIM, communicating with GSO space stations in the, in the FSS. And the second one uh, was uh, related to the allocation of the frequency band 51.4 to 52.4 uh, gigahertz to the fixed satellite service in the Earth to space direction for geostationary use. So coming to the first one, um, uh, dealing with Earth stations in motion, what we call ESIM. So what is that? Earth stations in motion are uh, Earth stations which are communicating with the fixed satellite service uh, stations, uh, geostationary stations, but they are uh, uh, installed in moving platforms. So they are uh, Earth stations in motion, as we say. And they, so we have three types, basically three types of uh, eSIM. We have uh, those earth stations installed in aircraft, so what we call aeronautical eSIM. They are installed in uh, ships and vessels, what we call maritime eSIM, and also installed in land vehicles. That's what we call land eSIM. And all these three types of eSIM can be used for broadband communications and in particular, uh, internet connectivity. Uh, so the conference, um, as you can see here in the first bullet, the conference defined the, uh, the regulatory, operational and technical conditions under which those bands can be used by SIM. So this is contained in a resolution approved uh, by the conference. And uh, what is important to say is that uh, these, those conditions were established for all regions. So it's a worldwide uh, decision applicable to all regions of the world, which is uh, really very important. So that's why we believe that this decision on ESIMs will certainly increase the use and foster the development of ESIMs at the same time providing appropriate protection to other GSO networks and non-GSO systems, as well as protection to terrestrial services. All these conditions are established in this resolution approved by the conference. So we believe that this will enable the broadband connection, as you can see in the third bullet, bullet here, for people on ships, that's a summary time seams, uh, aircraft, aeronautical seam, and land vehicles. 
by ensuring their safety, security, and comfort while in motion. And one last point in this last bullet that I would like to draw your attention is that this decision, in fact, extends the possibility that was offered by WRC 15, the previous conference, for a similar, for, for the ESIM, in a similar decision for the bands 19.7 to 20. 2 gigahertz in the downlink and 29.5 to 30 gigahertz in the uplink. So what I wanted to draw your attention is that if you compare the bands mentioned in the first bullet with those bands on the last bullet here, you will see that we now have 2.5 gigahertz in the downlink and 2.5 gigahertz in the uplink for eSIM in all regions worldwide. So we believe that this is uh, really a significant uh, achievement uh, if you look to the results of the two last uh, conferences. So regarding the next um, uh, slide here, the next uh, decision relating to the frequency band 51.4 to 52.4 gigahertz, that the, the, the conference added an allocation to the fixed satellite service in the earth to space direction in this frequency band for use by geostationary networks while protecting while providing again the, the appropriate protection to other services in that case the earth stations are limited to gateway earth stations with a minimum antenna diameter of 2.4 meters so we also believe this is an important decision to foster the provision of uh, broadband communications using geostationary satellites. And finally, uh, I would like just to uh, draw your attention to uh, three main agenda items. As you know, the conference uh, also approved the agenda for the next conference, which will be WC23. And in the agenda of the next conference, we can find uh, three items that are related to geostationary broadband satellite networks. As you can see here, the first one is agenda item uh, 115, uh, which will, similar to the other one on ESIM, will um, establish the conditions for the use of the frequency band 12.75 to 13.25 gigahertz in the earth to space direction by earth stations on aircraft and vessels communicating with GSO, geostationary space stations in the fixed satellite service globally, again, for all regions. The second one is agenda item 117, which is dealing with what our director mentioned this satellite to satellite link. So this under this agenda item, we will study the technical and operational issues and regulatory provisions for the provision of satellite to satellite links in the frequency bands mentioned here in, in, in this slide. And we believe, of course, uh, among those satellite to satellite links, there are geostationary stations, which will establish links with non-geostationary uh, satellites. So this is another uh, very interesting topic uh, or agenda item in the agenda of the next conference. And finally, agenda item 119, which will um, study and consider a new primary allocation for the fixed satellite service in the space to earth direction in the frequency band 17 dot three to 17.7 gigahertz in region two. So these are three uh, main uh, uh, items in the agenda of the next conference related to the topic of the discussion uh, today. So uh, with that, um, uh, I will uh, now uh, invite our distinguished uh, panelists to uh, elaborate on on their uh, on their ideas uh, on their views on the decisions of uh, WRC19 and their uh, how they see the opportunities related to this agenda items of the next conference WRC23 as well as the innovations on their uh, respective uh, uh, networks. So in that regard, so I will first start uh, with uh, Mr. Daryl Hunter from Viasat. Mr. Daryl Hunter is currently 
the Chief Technical Officer of uh, Regulatory Affairs at Viasat. Mr. Hunter uh, is a leader in the legal regulatory group, which manages the licensing of satellites and nerve stations for Viasat worldwide, as well as participating in national, regional, and international race regulatory groups. Before joining Viasat, uh, Mr. Hunter worked for GT Spacenet, Satellite Business Systems, and the US Army in roles which included system engineering, product development, product management, and application sales support. So, Dario, thank you very much for your participation again. The floor is yours. Thank you, Dario. Okay, thank you, Nelson. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to uh, to all of our uh, guests. And also, thank you and welcome to the the other panelists. Let me get started on my presentation here. Let's see if I can share my desktop and start the presentation. Okay. So, um, so world of innovation for uh, uh, GSO satellite systems. As uh, as Nelson said, <clears throat> we had uh, seen really a, a number of of applications that were um, offered by the 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 past three WRCs uh, or the past two in the current uh, coming WRC. So it's really a tripling down of on satellite activities in the 28 gigahertz band. So as Nelson said, it, uh, WRC recognized the satellite use in KA band was well established with, uh, with many new satellites and services being developed. Uh, the WRC considered KA as a place for growth for satellite services and chose not to study this band for IMT. Um, the, the conference approved the resolution on GSO eSIM in the 29.5 to 30 gigahertz band they also uh, assigned the agenda item just to, to study GSO eSIMs in the 27.5 to 29.5 gigahertz band. And uh, WRC 19, uh, we studied the issue, uh, proved the GSO eSIMs, as Nelson said, in the 27.5 gigahertz band. And then uh, WRC 19 has two additional items uh, related to the 28 gigahertz band. Uh, one uh, is not related to GSO particularly, but it's the non-geostationary ESIM in uh, in the KA band, and then also, as mentioned, the satellite to satellite links in the KA band, as well as some other frequency bands. So, as a result, satellite operators are responding uh, with investments of millions of dollars for new generations of high throughput satellites and new services that uh, are really going to benefit the global customer base. Biosat 3 uh, is really a, a game-changing innovation in that. So we started with uh, with Biosat 1 uh, a number of years ago, and I'll talk more about that in a, in a minute. Biosat 2 up there, Biosat 3, which will will uh, launch at the end of 2021, the first one, and um, the uh, um, uh, second Biosat 3. The first one will cover the uh, Americas, the, the next one will cover Europe, Middle East, and Africa, and the third one will cover a Asia. So the first one will launch at the end of 2021, um, then the, the next one in 2022, and then the, the third one will follow after that. These satellites have true global, or sorry, true visible Earth coverage uh, for, for each satellite, and the three of them in the constellation will, will have global coverage. So uh, at each satellite, we'll, we'll have greater than a terabit per second of capacity. Uh, Oops, sorry. Oops. So uh, how does this happen? So the, the advancements in the satellite uh, design for increased throughput speed and coverage uh, really happened as a, as a result of, of uh, improved integration, miniaturization, and uh, just a, a lot of technical advancements that we made. So uh, on the right-hand side of the slide, you can see the, the communication panels that were part of the Viasat 1 payload and you can see the the people standing around the, the payload to give you an idea of the the size of the of the communications panel and i said one had a, had a throughput of a, uh, about 140 gigabits per second uh, and at that time was the highest capacity satellite uh, in, in orbit so now you look at the same thing the biosat 3 
module is now down to hand size with the person standing next to it. Similarly, uh, this uh, improvement technology allows us to reduce the size of the gateways from a traditional, you know, 11 to, to 9 meter type gateway down to the Biosat 1 is 7.3. And the Biosat 3, we're down in the 1.8 to 2.4 meter range. So this, uh, this enables us to provide services here, there, and anywhere. So we can operate in the air, we can operate on the ground, and we can operate at sea. So we, we provide service to commercial airlines, business jets, VIP, uh, government aircraft, and um, uh, you know, cruise ships, private yachts, and commercial vessels, and then direct internet to home providers, businesses, and then uh, and then we've got some land-based vehicles, emergency service vehicles, ambulances, buses, mass transit, and, and so on. So uh, eSIM, which is uh, something we've been really working on for a long time at uh, Biosat, uh, and as well as with others in the industry, They've been providing services to, to mobile broadband for over two decades, starting really back with the, uh, the connection by Boeing and, and even before that with um, uh, some some equipment uh, that was done by uh, Linkabit in the KU band. So we've been operating GSO eSIM in the KA band for nearly a decade. And, uh, and we brought that work to the ITU and the ITU has recognized that uh, these eSIM stations can operate uh, compatibly with other services, and uh, and we've approved them in the past two WRCs, and so now they're really considered uh, just an, another typical air station. And we meet with that uh, aircraft passengers. We we can have provide crew communications. We can provide gate to gate service for customers, and uh, and then some enhancements for the fleet to, to operate and provide their internal communications. Similarly, for for uh, passenger vessels, um, freight vessels, and, and that for maritime. And uh, importantly, Viasat has about 270 mobility authorizations today, which we've been working on for a long time, starting in the KU band and now uh, in the KA band, of which we have about 120 uh, countries authorized so far. And uh, more authorizations are coming soon as we're working on that very hard. So uh, th there's really a very good chance that you've already used KA band uh, GSO eSIM service, if you've flown on, on most commercial airlines today, use, if not Biosat service, uh, that of another satellite operator, because satellite's really the, the choice for in-flight connectivity. We've got an installed fleet of about 1,400 commercial aircraft, plus uh, several hundred other types of aircraft, and a backlog of about 750 aircraft. And to give you an idea of kind of how how much this is used, we have annual flights with uh, biostatic equipped eSIMs of uh, 1.83 million. Uh, we've got 145 device connections per year, and that's phones, iPads, uh, PCs. And in many cases, we have more connected devices than, um, than passengers, and sometimes because passengers will connect multiple devices. And we delivered approximately 7.5 petabytes of data. And uh, so next, I'll, I'll play a, um, a short video. sharing and reshare. So you have to check that each time, I guess. Okay, let's try again. Sorry. Yep, yeah, perfect.
Okay, back to my presentation. So that was a, that was a, a video from uh, one of our, our launch customers for our commercial aviation Wi-Fi, JetBlue. And uh, they're, they're very pleased with the, the service. And uh, we've had a number of, of uh, reports of feedback on, on that. So regarding the, the licensing for eSIM, I think one of the things that we see is is we know that there are uh, more than 120 countries that have already authorized a KA ban eSIM. And, uh, and we found that our com countries should really feel comfortable authorizing eSIMs across the, the, the band. We really have uh, a lot of practice operating these stations and uh, in running them com compatibly and controlling them. I've been uh, the, the regulatory contact at BiSAT for 25 years, and, uh, and, and so I'm the person to call if there's interference. And so far, I've never in all these years received a, a, a report of interference from uh, an, an eSIM. So, um, streamlining is really the approach that we see with, with this. Um, a lot of, uh, of countries will authorize uh, eSIMs in kind of a blanket fashion where they're, they're uh, able to file one license application, which will then cover the, the rest of the stations of that similar type in the country. And uh, in many countries, we'll allow guest eSIM that are licensed by another administration to, to operate uh, on a license exempt basis in their, their own country, provided that, that we follow the rules of that, uh, of that guest country. So um, the, the next thing I want to talk about was the, our Viasat community internet. Another thing that's, that's uh, provided by uh, the, the bandwidth and the broad coverage the satellite has, we've got the ability to reach um, hard to reach places uh, we we can quickly bring internet to locations with limited connectivity or no g service they don't have 5g 4g 3g they have zero g they have to get in a in a vehicle drive away for some distance in order to get some coverage to to get um, services and so we are able to come in and, and drop connectivity into that location um, really just within a day and and provide that so k band coverage and capacity are the key it makes it um, it's inexpensive to install. It offers a service to users at an affordable price, and we can scale to meet coverage and, and uh, capacity demands. And so, uh, one of the videos I was going to share with this uh, covers uh, something in uh, uh, our um, moderator. I think will will appreciate some uh, service that we're providing in Brazil. So let me get to that next one. No Brasil, muitas pessoas carecem de acesso confiável à internet, especialmente fora das grandes cidades. Com nosso parceiro no Brasil, Telebrás, estamos levando a internet a todo o Brasil, do Oiapoque ao Chuí, pois todo brasileiro merece estar conectado. a Via Sat, conectando o mundo. Uma pessoa, uma família, uma nação de cada vez. Ok. Time to the... So, and uh, that's the conclusion of, this, of the uh, slide. So, uh, with that, thank you. And I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dario, for this very, very interesting presentation. I think we have time for just uh, one or a couple of questions. There was a, 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 an interesting question here, though I think it was re uh, answered, but I mean, it's interesting in any way. It's regarding the size, the physical size of a eSIM. Uh, the question is, is it bigger than handheld? But I would just okay first that question but then then further elaborate how do you see uh the evolution of the uh this eSIM for the free applications uh regarding this size it's i, I guess it will become smaller and smaller but but to, to, just to get your views on that thank you Dario. yeah yeah thank you nelson so um with the size today we are operating eSIM as small as 30 centimeter so these um these eSIM are mounted <clears throat> on uh, the tail 
of uh, some of the smaller aircraft that can accommodate the larger fuselage mounted antenna. So they'll be up on top of the vertical stabilizer in uh, in many cases. Uh, we also have installations where that uh, that same antenna is mounted on a uh, emergency escape hatch on some of the uh, the aircraft uh, that, that are used um, in a number of applications. And for example, some of the firefighting aircraft that can dump water and things like that, they can get communications that way without having to have a full uh, installation of the, of the aircraft. And we've got um, Viasat and, and others um, are, are bringing to market low profile uh, antennas that are that are nearly conformal to the top of the fuselage. They're very small, but uh, ultimately, you know, we like to keep them as large as we can to keep the beam width down so that we limit the the um, uh, you know any, any emissions towards other satellites. But that's that's where we're at right now today. About thirty centimeters is the smallest. We think we can get down lower than that with with uh, spectrum spreading, which we do use on that thirty centimeter. Term. Okay. Thank you very much, Dario. And and just uh, uh, one other question that just uh, came here, saying how different are ESIM from Big N satellite terminal that have been uh, there for for quite some time, the Big N. Uh, so, what what are basically the, the differences? Well, the frequency band um, in part. So the Big N uh, operate down at, at much lower frequencies than we're, we're operating in the in the KU and KA band. They uh, they are part of the mobile satellite service. So they they have antennas that are you know broadly directional, generally up, upwards, and uh, and some antennas are a little more directional than others. But they're not the very narrow beam widths that we use for communicating with GSO satellites that are down in the, you know, the fraction of a, of a degree range, and they can't support the kind of data rates that we do with uh, the terminals today. So, there's, um, uh, in fact, uh, uh, something I saw the other day. One of the uh, maritime terminals that we're trialing on is a, a, a yacht called Delos, and you can watch videos of that online at YouTube. And when they installed the, the terminal and tested it there. They did uh, their initial download speed test was 126 megabits per second, and then the the upload speeds are more modest because the you know the terminals don't need to generally transmit as much traffic. So I think the throughput speeds would be the you know one of the biggest differences you'd see. Okay, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Dario. So I think now uh, we should uh, go to the uh, our second uh, uh, presentation. Uh, our second speaker, which is uh, Miss uh, Kimberly Bound from EchoStar. So, Miss Kimberly Bound uh, currently uh, works for EchoStar Huge as Vice President of uh, Regulatory Affairs. Her role covers all aspects of uh, regulatory affairs, including maintaining the spectrum rights for the company's satellite fleet, defining and executing a uh, spectrum strategy domestically and around the world, and acquiring new spectrum. Prior to joining EchoStar Hughes, Ms. Baum held uh, regulatory spectrum positions at, at SES Americom, Motorola, and Astrolink International. So, uh, Kim, thank you very much for your participation at this webinar, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Kim. Thank you, Nelson, and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. Let me get my slides up and running, hopefully um, fairly quickly here. So in thinking about preparing for this um, panel, I knew that my, my colleagues would likely talk a lot about mobility. And so I'm going to focus on um, other aspects of our business, but certainly, you know, we agree with our colleagues that mobility is certainly a very important and growing sector um, you know, for our company as well. So I'm going to speak about the Hughes part of our business, and that's the part of our business that develops um, broadband satellite technology and provides broadband services to consumers, you know, either in the home or to offices. And HughesNet is our 
high speed um, satellite internet service, and it's the world's largest satellite broadband network with more than 1.5 million residential and small business customers across the Americas. We serve six Latin American countries with 364,000 subscribers, and those are growing um, all the time. And in the United States, we have about 69% of the, the market share. And who are our customers? They're typically people who live beyond the reach of fiber and cable. Um, but our services allow people to to live where they love. You don't have to move to an urban center. You can stay connected and um, you know, still work and provide world-class education to your children. And unlike terrestrial build out to the last mile, we can get service up and running in a matter of you know, a couple of days with minimal infrastructure cost. And you can see on our slides here that we have the, the ITU Gold Sector member. We're proud to be sector members of both ITUR and ITUD. Then I wanted to get, just give you a snapshot of our network here, our satellites. We have two um, Hughes-owned and operated satellites, Jupiter-1 and Jupiter-2. And we also lease capacity on um, Hughes-63 West and Hughes-65 West. And those are satellites actually owned and operated by Telesat and Utilsat, respectively. And today we deliver more than 400 gigabits per second of capacity. We're building a new satellite, Jupiter-3, which is going to launch in the first quarter of 2022. And with Jupiter-3, we'll more than double um, our capacity, our available throughput today. And with Jupiter-3, we'll be able to deliver broadband speeds of more than 100 megabits per second, and we'll reach 80% of the population and have more than, than 50 Gateway Earth stations in operation. So as capacity is increasing, um, the satellite broadband market continues to grow. In 2019, um, satellite broadband revenue grew by 19%, and the subscribership grew approximately 10% to 2.6 million. And most of those subscribers are in the United States today with numbers growing steadily outside of the US. And as the capacity has increased over time, um, you know, since approximately 2014, revenues have been growing steadily. And if you look at this chart here on the right, um, you'll see that by 2026, NSR predicts that there'll be approximately 10 million GSO broadband subscribers. So this is certainly an area that continues to grow as we bring you know, more satellites to the market. So I wanted to give a few real world examples here. Um, and I truly hope those parrots aren't interfering with reception of our service here. I think that picture is from Columbia. But here we have a couple of statements from some of our, our customers. Um, in La Higuera in Chile, about 500 kilometers north of Santiago, a teacher, Thomas Rodriguez, says that there is no distance anymore and there are no remote places. So our services really allow him to feel connected. And then in northern Brazil, a video blogger, Fran Adorno, stays connected to her two million followers. And in the Peruvian jungle, our services allow Javier Albuquerque to gain information and support his son's studies. My, my favorite shot pictures here is um, one of our installers on horseback, and you can tell it's a fairly recent photo because he's wearing a mask. But, um, you know, our network of installers will do whatever it takes to get our services to customers. So if horseback is the only way to get um, to a new customer, then, you know, they strap our dish or equipment on the horse and, and off they go to, to get it to those remote customers. And next, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, a topic Daryl discussed as well, um, but that's satellite-enabled community Wi-Fi, which is also a growing opportunity um, for GSO satellites. So to, to recap what the service is, um, it's a, a way to provide internet connectivity to a lower end user point. So you would put a VSAT antenna at a central location in a town, um, perhaps on a government building or on a store. And then the modem is connected to a Wi-Fi access point that would provide Wi-Fi connectivity to 
customers in an approximate 100 meter radius around the access point. And then um, the retailer would sell Wi-Fi service data packs to the public. Um, end users would buy like prepaid data in affordable bite-sized chunks um, or the service in some cases may be subsidized by the government. And if you look at the chart on the left, um, by 2027, NSR predicts that um, approximately 40% of the overall revenue for satellite broadband will be um, from these Wi-Fi hotspots. So it's certainly a growing, um, a growing segment. And for Hughes, um, our satellite enabled community Wi-Fi hotspots meet, reach more than 25 million people. And just looking at the Americas with, um, we have 22,000 Wi-Fi hotspots in Mexico reaching more than 22 million people. And that's a government subsidized program. So it's really providing free connectivity to many, many people. And then similarly in Brazil, we're reaching more than 2 million people with government subsidized uh, Wi-Fi. So I think this is really an exciting opportunity that you know allows us to bridge the digital divide and shows how different technologies, like in this case, satellite and Wi-Fi, you know, are complementary and really working together to connect people around the world. And then I just wanted to show one um, one case study of a Wi-Fi site in Brazil. We're all very focused on Brazil because of our moderator Nelson. Uh, this site, I probably won't pronounce it correctly, but is Puracau in Brazil, about 1.5 hours um, north of um, Sao Paulo, with a, a town with about 35 homes. If you look closely there, it's hard to see, but you can see the, the VSAT on the roof. You know, I've labeled it, and then also the access point. And um, user data packs, order of 70 megabits to 4 gigabytes are sold on an hourly or monthly basis. And it was a very popular service to the community with a fast ramp up of usage. So I just, I, I like this. Um, I know it's a little bit of a fuzzy picture, but it's nice to see, um, you know, the services. I think in, in reality and perhaps not a, a glossy marketing shot. And finally, I wanted to talk a little bit about WRC's impact on satellite broadband. And one key thing, you know, certainly all services need access to adequate spectrum to continue to grow, and the same is true for satellite broadband. And in particular, you know, we need capacity in the forward link. So that would be the gateway uplinks to the satellite and then down um, to the user terminals. So looking back at work 19, um, certainly I agree with Nelson that um, issue 9.1.9 .9 was very important in adding a, a new GSO FSS allocation in 51.4 to 52.4. This is already, it's contiguous with an existing FSS allocation below 51.4, which makes the implementation on the satellite cheaper, so it's quite valuable. And we're already planning um, QV band feeder links on the new satellite I had mentioned, Jupiter 3. And while it's too late to, to add this band to that satellite at this point, you know, we're certainly planning to use it on our future satellites, perhaps Jupiter 4 or Jupiter 6. Then also um, agenda item 1.6 addressed QV bands. And while it was focused really on NGSO, GSO sharing, um, it also looked at um, whether or not the GSO limits to protect the Earth Exploration Satellite Service in 50.2 to 50.4 were appropriate. And um, we were able to negotiate um, changes to those limits that still allow Gateway Earth Station to access you know, the FSS bands immediately adjacent to that frequency. So you know, that was very important to you know, continue to be able to use those bands already allocated to the FSS. And then finally, certainly agenda item 1.13 was a, a big item um, looking at identifying additional frequency bands for IMT. And it did not identify two key satellite bands, 48.2 to 50.2 gigahertz, which is identified for high density deployment of FSS Earth stations in region two or 50.4 to 51.4 gigahertz, which is an important band um, at a minimum for gateway uplinks um, around the world. And in the bands that were identified for IMT, 
like where there was a satellite allocation, um, there are some protections for FSS. For example, they identify the identifications themselves recognize that a country may not identify the entire band, but portions thereof. Um, there are also some provisions um, uh, encouraging down tilt of antennas and avoiding pointing towards the GSO arc. Um, as well as just general recognition that administration should, you know, consider and accommodate other services such as FSS. Um, you know, so certainly it's important um, to maintain access to these bands, even when they're identified or used by other services for the FSS. And then looking forward to work 23, um, again, I, I agree with Nelson. I think agenda item 1.19 is an important one for satellite broadband. It's looking at allocating 17.3 to 17.7 and region two to FSS downlinks. And this band is really ideal because it's not shared with terrestrial services. So it could easily be used by user terminals or gateways. It's also contiguous to an existing um, FSS allocation, a global one that starts at 17.7. So I think it's really an attractive band um, for the satellite community to expand into. And under other items that Nelson mentioned, agenda item 1.16, looking at NGSO, eSIMS, and KA band, and 1.17, looking at satellite to satellite links in both parts of KU and KA band, you know, we feel like an important part of that is going to be ensuring the protection of, you know, GSO links that are already operating today and that they, you know, continue to be able to operate as planned. And then beyond the WRC um, actions itself, um, you know, there's other important ongoing IT work that I wanted to mention. Um, so currently, you know, in Working Party 4A, there's work going on to look at potential revisions to Recommendation S-1503, which um, provides the description of the software that determines um, whether or not an NGSO system meets the EPFD limits to protect GSOs. So certainly, you know, we think that work is important. Um, and while it's important to provide flexibility where we can to NGSO systems, it's important that, you know, the limits to protect GSOs, you know, are met. And then there's a few follow-up items from Work 19 that won't necessarily go to a conference, but are certainly important uh, work for the ITUR to undertake. And that includes um, some items from 1.6, looking at the aggregate interference from multiple NGSO systems into GSO links, and also how to validate the GSO supplemental links. And finally, there's some follow-up from agenda item 1.13, and uh, where the ITU decisions from the conference may not have included a lot of detail on how to accommodate sharing, you know, the ITUR is asked to develop recommendations or reports um, to help administrations in, you know, ensuring successful coexistence between IMT and FSS. So that's certainly important work um, that we're glad to see has started, at least in the, the 25 to 27 gigahertz band. And then finally, and this may be a work item, um, so perhaps I should have had it on the other slide, but I had more room here. Um, there's a task to follow up and look at number 21.5, which is a general um, power limit on terrestrial systems and how it applies to IMT systems using uh, more advanced antenna technology. So we feel like that's an important one to ensure, you know, um, we don't have significant increases in the interference um, on FSS or satellite uplinks. So that's my last slide, Nelson. I'm going to hand it back to you. And thank you, everyone. Thank you very, very much, uh, Kim, for this very, very interesting uh, presentation. And uh, just we have a bit of time for one or two questions. So, so one question you you mentioned about these decisions of the RC and uh, decisions relating to IMT and to um, satellite. So, one question that I, I think it's coming every time that we go to any presentation or any uh, any event is regarding this uh, sharing so so clearly the, the frequency sharing is increasing as the spectrum becomes more uh, congested with greater demands for all services to meet expanding customer requirements so in your view can satellite broadband share 
with other services. What are your views on, on that point? Thank you. So I think um, you know, we need access to some frequency bands for user terminal operations. You know, I had said that we can deploy uh, a new um, broadband terminal in you know, two days. Well, to be able to do that, we don't have time to go through a site coordination process. So we really need access to spectrum, um, you know, for those user terminals that that isn't shared, um, so that we can deploy quickly um, and in, really in a given country. But I think on the other hand, like for our gateway spectrum, you know, there are ways that we can share through site coordination or other means for where we can take more time to do coordination and activities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kim. And uh, just a quick question. This is uh, regarding this issue of latency. So there's a question that you just received here is in uh, relate says that in the competition with non GSO players, how do you address the, the latency issue? How critical the latency from geostationary uh, satellites impacts uh, your customers' uh, needs? So the vast majority of um, you know internet applications you know aren't latency sensitive. So we think that's um, an important um item to point out you know certainly there are a few applications like gaming or something that is very um latency sensitive so you know we don't feel like the the general user that latency is a you know a critical um showstopper you know but certainly there are just factual difference in the latency of different systems okay so thank you thank you very much uh, kim for this very interesting uh presentation again so moving uh, to our next uh, speaker, which is uh, Mr. Jonas Enneberg from Imarsat. Um, Jonas uh, Enneberg is currently the Vice President of uh, Regulatory Engineering at Imarsat, where he has worked for the last uh, 25 years. He is responsible for Imarsat's spectrum uh, regulatory matters, including ITR activities such as WRC participation and uh, frequency coordination of Imarsat satellite uh, networks. And before uh, joining Imarsat, uh, Mr. Enneberg worked at the National Post and Telecom Agency in Sweden. So, Jonas. Uh, Thank you very much again for your participation in this webinar and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jonas. Yeah, thank, thank you, Nelson. Uh, let me just see if I can share my screen, first of all. Okay, I hope that everyone can see that. Um, <clears throat> So hi everyone. Uh, I'll, uh, mainly, my presentation will focus on some giving some information about uh, Inmarsat's Global Express Network, which is our uh, um, KA band satellite network. But I'll start with uh, actually changing my screen or slide. Uh, start with giving a little bit of a brief, very brief history of Inmarsat and overview of our operations in in other bands as well. So, as you may know, Inmarsat has been around for about 40 years now, and uh, for most of that time we focused uh, exclusively on providing L-band mobile satellite um, operations. It was um, originally set up as an intergovernmental organization to provide uh, maritime safety communications, uh, which eventually became part of GMDSS. And uh, since then, we've expanded into other markets, including aeronautical safety, AMSRS, as well as commercial operations uh, to all, to all types of mobile terminals, uh, land, maritime, aeronautical. Um, so we've uh, continued to evolve and improve our L-band services over time. Uh, the graphic on this slide gives an outline of uh, when we launched uh, new satellite generations and the uh, improvements in, uh, in capabilities of each of those generations. Uh, 
So you can see that uh, we've each generation has uh, improved, increased data rates, and uh, also provide more capacity. And of course, that allows us to gradually improve the services we provide to our customers. Uh, the next stage in that evolution is uh, the launch of a couple of satellites over the next couple of years, which is will be our fifth generation of L-band uh, satellites, which is called Inmasat 6. Uh, so um, L-band continues to be important to us, and we're continuing to maintain and improve those services. But we did realize, uh, well, more than a decade ago, I suppose, that uh, uh, we can't meet all our customers' needs in L-band alone, um, because of band uh, we have available to uh, uh, for MSS in L-band is uh, pretty limited. So we looked at other frequency bands and decided to develop, start developing a, uh, a system for KA band, which we call Global Express, and uh, that development started about 10 years ago. Uh, so GX is basically uh, uh, in terms of uh, our strategy and and uh, you know to provide global connectivity to mainly mobile users uh, is basically an evolution of, of our outbound services but of course it provides much higher data rates and overall capacity thanks to the uh, spectrum allocations available in in ka band compared to what's uh, what's there in outbound uh, so uh, as several people have mentioned already, to realize specifically our plans for GX and for other operators as well, we have similar plans. Uh, uh, we have um, had some regulatory challenges over the last uh, uh, period, a um, couple of conferences. Uh, so Nelson presented already the eSIM decisions, which were instrumental for us. Uh, um, and uh, that that's that's been something that's uh, uh, that uh, been very important for us. I'll come back a little bit further to that in a later slide as well. Uh, finally, we also have an S band system. Uh, we participated in an EU bidding process uh, probably a decade ago as well uh, for access to the S band MSS spectrum, the two gigahertz. And we were one of the two licensees that were awarded Spectrum. So we um, decided to use that Spectrum for an aeronautical service in Europe, which we've called the European Aviation Network. And we launched um, our satellite, MSIS, uh, in 2017. It's actually a payload on the Hellasat satellite. And uh, we have also developed and deployed a network of terrestrial base stations across Europe. Uh, so-called uh, complementary ground component uh, in the CPT terminology. Um, so EAN is now operational and uh, provides broadband services to airline passengers across Europe. So uh, looking um, a bit closer at GX specifically, um, we have invested uh, substantial amounts into developing this system and so far we've launched five GX satellites. All of them are geostationary satellites um, and we have plans for several more satellites coming up in the next few years, all of which are fully funded and under construction. So the first four satellites that we launched, um, GX1 to 4, they were all identical satellites uh, with um, um, global footprint or, or field of view footprint on the, uh, and uh, together they provide us with global coverage uh, up to about 65 or 70 degrees latitude uh, and this uh, as I mentioned uh, important part of our strategy is to provide global mobility so uh, that was the first stage in, in our um, development to, um, to make sure we have the glo global coverage we're now adding satellites to that to uh, increase the capacity and performance in uh, in particular in key hotspots uh, and high traffic areas <clears throat> the first of the additional satellites it was gx5 that we launched last year uh, that satellite will provide service in europe and the, and the middle east and 
Uh, following that, we'll have seven more satellites that are under construction, and they will be launched in the next uh, three or four years. Uh, so those satellites are beginning with the GX-6 satellite, which is also called Inmarsat-6, as I mentioned, that's the next generation of L-band satellites. These two will be launched in next year and in 2022. Uh, they have uh, um, stereo beam clusters that will provide uh, coverage and extra capacity in, in, in high traffic areas. Uh, following that, uh, we are launching starting in 2023, the GX7, 8 and 9 satellites. And uh, they're very high, high capacity satellites, uh, higher than any of the others that we, we've launched. Um, they're also designed to be very flexible, so they're able to allocate spectrum and power and change coverage real real time across the field of view of the satellite so uh, very flexible and uh, enabled to do, to have this ability to dynamically adjust the deployment of um, of the satellite capacity it makes the operation of the satellite much more efficient so we can maximize the fill rate of the satellites uh, much more than we can for, for satellites with fixed beam patterns or with other uh, constraints. In those in many cases, uh, a lot of capacity will, will be unused um, in low demand um, traffic areas, especially for mobile markets, because uh, the, the traffic patterns of, of our mobile users uh, is quite dynamic and varies a lot across, uh, across the geographical areas and over time. Um, also, similarly, in, in comparison to LEO constellations, we believe that uh, these uh, flexible satellites, flexible geostationary satellites, also uh, are more efficient because they don't, um, they don't, they, they, they can avoid having uh, capacity um, covering areas where there's low traffic demand. Uh, and the final piece of um, of our GX, our currently planned GX deployment is GX10. This is a collaboration with Space Norway, and it consists of two HEO satellites, which will extend our GX coverage into the Arctic above 65 degrees north. And uh, those satellites will be launched 2022 or 2023, and uh, so they're likely to be uh, in place before GX seven, eight, and nine have all been uh, been launched. Okay, moving on to a little few words about the spectrum we're using for for GX. Um, the the core user link spectrum that we use is uh, twenty nine five to thirty gigahertz and nineteen point seven to twenty one two gigahertz. Uh, of course, these are the bands that were. Uh, discussed at WRC 15 um, with um, the development of resolution 156, and uh, so we have those satellite, those uh, those bands available in, in full on all the satellites uh, that I've mentioned. In addition, we uh, also have user links in the lower part of the K band, 27.5 to 29.5 gigahertz and 17.7 to 19.7. Um, the slightly different statuses vary a little bit between them, but uh, substantial portions are available on all of them. And on GX7, 8, and 9, we have the ability to operate user links across uh, the full band. Uh, in addition, we have payloads in the 30 to 31 gigahertz and 20.2 to 21.2 gigahertz, which are intended for uh, our government customers. Uh, so, uh, regarding feeder links, we uh, have KA band feeder links on all of these satellites that I mentioned. Um, we also have added Q and V band, uh, 40, 50 gigahertz uh, feeder links for some of the later satellites. Um, and uh, this is to, uh, in order to, uh, first of all, get more spectrum for our feeder links and then be able to increase capacity that way and also to free up some of the spectrum in KA band for uh, for more efficient use of uh, user links. Okay, so for my final slide is just 
to go a little bit um, give an overview of um, ITU studies that we are following. Um, as I've uh, alluded to already, we've been very busy over the last couple of study cycles with all the work on, on eSIMS and uh, the two resolutions that were adopted at WLC 15 and 19 are quite important for us uh, as for others, others that I've talked about as well. Um, they give us a, a good platform to, to use the K-band spectrum for GX as most of our most of our uh, market is, is, is mobile. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, following on from WRC 19, uh, we are now following closely national uh, discussions and implementation of resolution 169 uh, and uh, national rules for, for allowing eSIMS, as we also did following WRC 15. And we're also participating in um, in the work to develop a methodology for, for BR uh, validation of the aeronautical ECM PFD limits that were part of uh, Resolution 169. Uh, another subject that we are following closely is uh, national spectrum plans in uh, the bands that were identified for IMT at WRC 19. Of course, uh, some of those bands are shared with satellite services. Particularly for us, the Q and V band are important. Uh, from start, that's why we are initially at least plan, planning to operate our, our feeder links and hopefully in the longer term future uh, also user links. Um, so we're keen to uh, to uh, have a dialogue with administrations about uh, which part of, the, of these bands will be made available for IMT or 5G and uh, what sharing conditions will be adopted uh, in the band. Uh, of course, we uh, are active also in the preparations for WRC 23. Uh, just listed some of the items here that uh, are of interest to us. Uh, we operate feeder links here since many years in extended C band. So uh, under agenda item 1.2 and 1.3, we're uh, uh, keen to see uh, that that those uh, operations will will continue to be protected. Uh, we are following the work work on suborbital vehicles, which is of interest to us, and uh, items that have been mentioned already. Uh, non GSO. Well, we we, we follow non GSO ESIM. Um, we will have, as you saw earlier, a couple of non GSO satellites, so that directly affects us. Also, of course, the sharing with GSO. Is, is of interest to us and studies on inter-satellite links again um, potentially of interest to us but also in terms of sharing with with our GSO satellites and of course agenda item seven has some interesting topics that uh, we um, will follow closely uh, outside of the WRC process we have uh, several other studies that we're following uh, and uh, there, there are, there's quite a lot going on with, with regards to non-GSO operations. Uh, so we are interested to, to, uh, to see how that develops and uh, in particular in relation to sharing with uh, GSO satellites. And then we have some MSS related items that uh, are dealing with uh, uh, sharing or compatibility between IMT systems and MSS in L band and in, in S band. So, uh, yeah, ITU definitely continues to keep us very busy and we uh, look forward to continuing uh, the work. And that's, that's the end of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jonas, for this uh, very, very interesting presentation. You had a lot of work, a lot of developments. Uh, so, we just quickly a couple of questions uh, so one uh, interesting question um, is regarding something that you mentioned uh, regarding the work on national implementation of this uh, famous resolution 169 adopted at the last uh, conference so uh, what are the aspects of that work that are important to imarsat thank you okay thank you Nelson. Um, <clears throat> Well, well, first of all, uh, we 
would like this to be a, a trigger for administrations to uh, to adopt licensing rules for eSIMs in, in those bands, uh, if they haven't already done so. And I, I know many countries have already, have already done that. I also know that there are many countries having discussions, and we've been engaging with some countries to, um, to discuss these issues. Uh, so we hope that they will see this as a good opportunity to enable uh, um, eSIM services in uh, their countries. Um, they, the bands, of course, are shared, but uh, we, we uh, would urge administrations to make as much spectrum as possible available exclusively for satellite. We believe at least some, some substantial portion of that is needed. I think other speakers, uh, Daryl perhaps mentioned that it's uh, it's essential for some some services to um, uh, you know to have to to be able to operate uh, across the whole coverage uh, to have uh, bands that are not shared. Other other things uh, like gateways etc. can share perhaps, but uh, mobile terminals like eSIMs need access to exclusive spectrum. Um, and. Um, you know, of course, there are sharing limits in resolution 169, um, and they apply in the portions of the bands that are shared with terrestrial services. Uh, but those limits, of course, impose some restrictions on, on eSIMs, uh, uh, in particular that maritime eSIMs can only operate uh, up to 70 kilometers outside the coastline, and aeronautical eSIMs need to meet PFD limits which uh, restricts the altitude that uh, you can operate at. So, um, yeah, they, these are, you know, it's again about how the administrations are uh, is, um, segmenting or, or uh, what, uh, what allocations they, they apply in, in, these, in these bands. And we'll of course, be looking at uh, um, discussing the benefits of eSIMs with those administrations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jonas. And, and very quickly, one point that you uh, mentioned in your last slide regarding this inter uh, of satellites to satellite uh, links. So you mentioned about, uh, I mean, the, the interest of Imarsat in following that uh, that agenda item. So just a, a question that I found uh, interesting. I think it was maybe partially replied, but in any way, I think it's good to bring. So how do uh, geostationary FSS service providers view the market potential? for serving non-GSO user space stations via satellites to satellite links if WRC23 provides the necessary regulatory recognition under agenda item 117. So how, how do you see this market potential for that? Thank you. Uh, well, I think definitely there is a market and uh, in Masada has been had uh, discussions uh, with the non-GSO operators about providing such services. Uh, so there, there's an interest in that. We also, uh, you know, um, we haven't focused necessarily on the uh, KA band side, but more on the L band side in, in terms of providing the services. But um, uh, yes, in principle, it's the same same market as or a similar market. Uh, so we will definitely see a lot of uh, interest from uh, from some non GSO operators. Thank you. Th thank you very much, Jonas, again for your very good uh, presentation. So now uh, moving to our uh, last uh, speaker of today, uh, which is uh, Mr. Hazen uh, Moakit from uh, Intelsat. So, um, Mr. Hazen uh, uh, Moakit uh, is currently the Vice President of Spectrum Strategy at Intelsat. He is responsible for shaping Intelsat's strategic long-term positioning in the marketplace and for managing and forts that protect, optimize, and leverage the company's spectrum assets, working closely with the company's uh, business development, asset management, and innovation teams to analyze and identify emerging growth opportunities. Prior to joining Intelsat, Mr. Market served as Vice President, Spectrum Development at O3B uh, Satellite Networks, and also as director of uh, regulatory and spectrum affairs at YASAT. So, uh, Hazen, thank you very much again for your participation in this webinar. The floor is yours, Hazen. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Nelson. Uh, good morning. Uh, good evening. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for being here. And uh, it's an honor to be uh, with you all, to be among friends and colleagues. And uh, without further ado, I uh, would like to uh, share with you uh, what Enlisat is doing uh, from an innovation standpoint that is uh, that would be of interest to the to the attendees to to know about. So let me start my presentation. All right. All right. Can you see it? Everyone's good. <clears throat> all right. So. Um, uh, as you're all familiar, uh, you know, Entelsat has been around for well over 50 years right now. We, uh, we, we started, essentially, we started satellite communications, uh, the, this sector in, in the early 60s with the launch of Early Bird. Um, and along, along this history, there has been many, uh, many firsts, uh, many, many uh, unique events that really helped shape the, the, the industry for years to come. So uh, uh, starting with the 1969, the uh, televising the first landing on the moon uh, to the first voice of data call in 1974 to, to a Queen Mary ship, going on and on. The Olympics uh, setting records for for a number of viewers watching the Olympics around the world and then launching uh, the first truly global HDS system in, in 2016. And last, and last but not least was uh, the mission extension vehicle uh, where we successfully docked uh, two, two commercial space stations in space. So, so we really do have a, a long history of innovation uh, in, in this field. So Edelsat has an unparalleled global footprint in terms of number of satellites. We operate 53 geostationary, geostationary satellites around the globe. Uh, providing services so that, that that are that are there that our people are, are living and using um, uh, so so this is something concrete that 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 is that is being relied upon globally um, uh, for for valuable services this is not to rest on basically on traditional um, on traditional uh, satellites we we also operate like I said a global uh, network of high throughput satellites that are in operation right now, providing services to, uh, to, to improve people's lives. So, and this, this is, this, this network is growing. There are more satellites under construction, um, uh, in this, uh, class of, uh, fleet. So, um, our philosophy, uh, for, for innovation. So, so we believe that the innovation starts at the at the connection at a connection. So, first, the way we look at it is that we try to expand the role of satellites, expand and broaden the the how satellites are being used to provide broadband connectivity. So, our next generation uh, uh, mobility solutions will enable five G, will enable IoT, and enable rural connectivity. We're also transforming, transforming our business model where we are becoming vertically integrated, providing uh, seamless services to, to our customers. Add to that our, our, uh, our expertise, uh, 50 plus years of ex experience in, in managing a global fleet. Uh, and then we're establishing partnerships with with uh, with, uh, with, uh, with 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 5G providers to to and, and then integrating our network to provide a, a hybrid satellite wireless service. So uh, that's that's our philosophy when it comes to innovation. It try to leverage on our uh, experience and and our uh, leadership in the market. So uh, I would first would like to kind of to take a quick uh, look at the mission extension vehicle. Uh, this is really uh, the first ever uh, commercial docking of two of two space stations that are in the commercial world. In the commercial world, obviously, this has happened many times in the space stations, but for for uh, for satellites, this is uh, this is the first time. And what this attempts to do is to extend the life of existing in orbit uh, satellites so uh, earlier this year we we the the uh, in partnership with northrop grumman 
uh, MAV-1 uh, docked with Intelsat 901, which was already in, in, um, at a higher orbit, uh, successfully docked with it, then it brought it back to service, and it's currently operating at 27.5. So as you know, normally uh, geostationary satellites have a lifespan of 15 years, but in some cases, it may be necessary to extend that life, and this allows us to do that uh, with, this, with this innovation. We, we have another uh, MAV, MAV-2, that is on its way to dock with Endelsat 1002. Again, it will provide an additional five year of service uh, to, uh, to that satellite. Now, talking about our FX 2.0. So, so, as I stated before, we have a fleet of traditional satellites that provide C and KU band services. Then we layered on top of that a fleet of high throughput satellites that operate again in C and KU band. Um, those, uh, those HTS, those high throughput satellites were, um, you know, are digital, they are very flexible. But what we wanted to do is, is that we wanted to take it to the next level. And with that, we, we, we decided to, to, to go to software defined satellites. Those software defined satellites, again, leverage the, 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 uh, the Intelsat uh, infrastructure, but also uh, deliver high throughput communications anywhere in the world. Software defined satellites are extremely flexible. Uh, whereby you can change frequencies, you can uh, do beamforming, uh, you, 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 you manage the, the power on, on the satellites. So it really provides you this uh, unparalleled flexibility in terms of, uh, in terms of providing services and uh, surgically targeting the areas that you need, where you need the capacity. Uh, unlike the prior generation satellites where the, the design is baked, into into the satellite with coverage. This allows you to shape the coverage, move the beams, change the frequencies as you as you as you see fit to really to meet the um, to meet the demands on the market. And this targets in a big way the the mobility segment, uh, providing uh, services to commercial aero, uh, to merchant shipping, uh, land mobile, and uh, government, military, and mobile networks. So so it it targets this. Uh, mobility segment. Those satellites also, I must say, they are going to operate in, in KU band in addition to KA and Q and V band. And we will rely on, on the, the added allocation of the, uh, the, uh, that was added in, in WRC 19 and the 51.4 band. So what does, what does, uh, what does EPIC 2.0 do? What does, what is, uh, what are the changes that, that are introduced in this system? So if you look in the middle here, so where I, whereas when you look at the architecture of traditional satellites, we're going to go from complex designs to really simplified, simplified and uh, an integrated design. Uh, in terms of technology, uh, we're going to go from hardware-based, proprietary, uh, inflexible to completely virtualized and, and, and standard-based uh, design. Uh, in terms of operations, again, going from manual, laborious, reactive uh, uh, mode into, into an automated, proactive, and integrated. So really, the attempt here is to try to, to become more seamless and to become more integrated into, into, the, into, into, the, uh, into the network, into, into the broader network. We're going to go from selling megahertz and megabits into, into managed solutions that, that, that emphasize service and value. In terms of pricing, pricing and scale, um, again, we'll go from the, the, the older rigid uh, pricing model to, to more value-based pricing and multi-tiered SLAs that really mimic what, what customers expect right now in the, in the telecommunications market. In terms of user experience, again, transforming from a complex multi-step systems into 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 a plug and play uh, uh, approach so so this this software defined satellite we attempt to really get closer to the customers and to become more seamless uh, uh, much like what customers expect now <clears throat> 
so so the the SD those SDS satellites are going to really be um, a platform to to leverage uh, uh, the the to leverage the the the, the Intelsat network. They are going to serve multiple verticals. Um, we're going to serve the aero and maritime, the the uh, uh, military and enterprise, and and the mobile industry. This will then integrate with the with the five G network. So it's where we have a virtualized uh, uh, network that that there's seamless connection among uh, all the various components, providing satellite broadband, and then serving serving uh, uh, rural communities, uh, media companies, enterprise, and government. So um, this this really attempts to combine all of these networks and, and integrate them uh, seamlessly. Epic 2.0 also emphasizes user experience. So, um, so if you look at, at three pillars, uh, you know, we, we look at enhanced portfolio of space space platform. So we're going to have the, the APEC 2.0 satellites. We have also have the diversified space based infrastructure. We're going to focus on enriched user experience. So smaller terminals, plug and play and end user engagement. And then it will also emphasize it automation and inter interoperability. So those are going to be uh, systems that are backward compatible and they're software defined and also interoperable with with uh, 3gbp uh, core so on the commercial aero intelsat is is one of the leading providers for commercial aero services and this attempts really to uh, build upon it where we enhance the service now we would have an always on service available in more planes enabling streaming and cellular roaming. And then, and, and, uh, as you know, uh, Intelsat recently acquired GoGo, so this fits uh, greatly with this. Uh, again, with uh, rural mobility, we partner with uh, uh, seven of the top 10 MNOs around the world to extend their coverage and uh, provide high speed access. Uh, maritime, again, uh, we are providing services to all vessels. With different service levels, a different addressing different needs, different quality of service, and for the military, uh, Intelsat is the is the largest provider uh, of of capacity to the to the U.S. military. So we provide unparalleled security and and uh, and service. So, how does this all connect with WRC? So uh, my colleagues have really done a great job in talking about all the WRC uh, agenda items from WRC 19 and going on to WRC 23. But one agenda item in particular that is of great importance is uh, for at least for us is agenda item 115, which attempts to uh, uh, harmonize the use of the frequency band 1275 to 1325 uh, by air stations on aircraft and vessels. Um, so, so uh, as you know, this band is the, the 1275 to 1325 is an appendix 30B band, which is uh, governed by the you know the infamous uh, plan of, of uh, country allotments. Um, the current rules of this uh, of this of this band preclude the possibility of using of using uh, mobile earth stations. So what we what we attempt to do what this agenda agenda item attempts to do is to enhance the flexibility of this band to allow the use of mobile terminals. So so this is in line with the other agenda items that uh, that uh, have been dealt with before for ESMs and WRC 19. So again, what what we what we attempt to achieve in the satellite industry really is to enhance the flexibility of spectrum that has already been assigned to satellite. So uh, there are bandwidth allocations, there are spectrum allocations where satellite is already allowed to use. What we attempt to use is to enhance the flexibility in these, in these, uh, in these bands to, to ensure <clears throat> efficient use of spectrum. So uh, uh, with that, uh, I would conclude my, my presentation. Uh, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hazan, for this uh, very, very interesting uh, presentation. A lot of innovation also in your in your presentation. Uh, just a couple of questions. Uh, 
uh, to you. So uh, yeah, so this is, seems to me there's a lot of interest in this mission extension vehicles that you mentioned. So, so again, why do we need uh, mission extension vehicles and what value do they bring? Thank you. Thank you. Well, as you know, uh, satellites have, have, a, have a life expectancy and um, uh, often there are cases where uh, uh, Apparently, we lost the connection. Okay, just wait one minute, please, to see if we reconnect with Hassan. Thank you. Okay, can you hear me? I'm back. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Yes, so so there are many cases where where satellites reach end of life, and the the business situation uh, delays the replacement, and yet there are critical services that are being provided. Um, this gives us opportunity to uh, to 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 extend the life of a satellite. As you know, when 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 satellites go out of service, it's often not because the electronics on the satellite have have uh, have ceased to operate. It's because the satellite runs out of propellant. And uh, the, if if there is a way to 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 keep using the satellite, then then that's that's again that that improves the business case, uh, and it improves the 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 efficiency of 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 the uh, of the overall business offering. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hazan. And, and another interesting point uh, raised about software design uh, satellite. How do you think this will make the industry more uh, responsive? Thank you. Thank you. So, so as we witness the evolution of the satellite industry over time, I mean, I can go back, you know, 15, 20 years ago when, when in the satellite industry we would uh, get uh, a certain customer profile where we are providing capacity and we enter into five year or 15 year or sometimes, you know, longer uh, commitment with customers to essentially to buy capacity uh, on and on and on. Uh, as 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 the business evolves, we're we're seeing more and more uh, customers looking for really short term uh, commitments, and we are also seeing that the that the the needs change a lot more rapidly than than they used to be. So, you de if you, if you design rigid satellite today to cover uh, to cover a certain area, the the need in five years or even three years may be completely different. So. This flexibility is really necessary. We we need to have the flexibility to change this this space asset to change the configuration, so that we can meet the demand of customers. Otherwise, you know, even with even with high uh, high throughput satellites, you, you you in a way you still bake in the the design of the satellite at the time of launch, and this is not while it can work in certain areas, but. The, 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 the what customers are looking for is is more flexibility and it allows us to to improve our return on investment and and improve our offering to our customers and also allows us to integrate better with with uh, with their networks thank you thank you very much Hazen. Uh, <clears throat> we still are receiving lots of questions but uh, let me uh, now uh, I think uh, then address those questions to everybody but before that let me so thank you very much Hazen, again for this very interesting uh, presentations uh, and presentation and let me put you just mention to you the results of our polls um, so um, regarding the first question in your view, what is the main challenge for GSO satellite operators uh, in the years to come? So one, one uh, uh, challenge was to secure spectrum being used and to identify more spectrum in higher frequency bands in order to make use of current and future innovation in satellite technology. So 33% responded in that way. 
Uh, another challenge, uh, coordination with other systems. We had 23% uh, responding that. And then the majority, 43%, responded to remain competitive vis-a-vis -vis non GSO satellite systems being deployed. So this is the uh, the first uh, question. The second question: uh, How long satellite television broadcasting is going to remain the most popular telecommunication satellite application for the general public? So we had 20% replying that it is already not the most popular telecom satellite application. We had 36% responding in the three to five years, 25% responding five to 10 years, and then 17% more than 10 years. Uh, and then the third question, do you consider that the GSO FSS and BSS fixed satellite service and broadcasting satellite service systems should continue to benefit from the regulatory advantage contained in the, the radio regulations number 22.2 .2, in light of the increasing sharing capacity of non-GSO systems. So we had the majority, 53% uh, replied yes and 9% no. And then we had the 38% of the reply saying that a sufficiently long transition to put GSO and non-GSO systems on an equal regulatory footing should be defined. Very interesting, uh, those results. So now I think we still have a few minutes for a general questions. I see many interesting questions. Up. Just one first, uh, which I found very interesting. It, it's, uh, I think, it's addressed to, to all of you. Uh, we have heard in previous presentations about the advantages of low latency. Can you try to give a picture of how GSO and LEO systems and applications might complement each other? So I don't know which one of you would like to start replying that question? I can say something. If you okay. like. Thank you. So, thank you. So, I mean, latency is certainly an important metric, you know, but it's, 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 in, in, in there are certain applications that, uh, that, that rely on low latency, but it's not the only metric when, when, when it comes to providing services. So, so, uh, there is something to be said about, about, uh, uh, you know, using using the right tool for the for the right job, and in in some cases, if latency is uh, is is important, then perhaps GSO may may not be suitable. But uh, again, uh, it's it's one metric, not not the only metric in in our view. Uh, don't know if the others would like to say something. Well, on that, yeah, yeah, certainly, and I, I would agree with with Oz and and also uh, a point made by Kim earlier, in that the majority of the traffic that we see on our system today is not really latency sensitive. It's it's um, you know principally video, and uh, and, uh, and and some other applications. There are certainly uh, latency sensitive applications. Some uh, some gaming, some telehealth. Um, you know, not all telehealth is latency sensitive, but um, but certainly some of that. And and there is some opportunity to complement the the GSOs with within GSOs. And I and I think a number of us operators actually have filings for NGSO systems. Vice does, and and others do, which um, will work in in. Um, you know, uh, complementary fashion to our global fleet once they're up there. So we have some applications that, when they really are latency sensitive, can be steered towards uh, towards those NGSOs. So. And, and, and one point is that at a global level, in fact, latency over satellite becomes less because anybody who has tried to do a ping test to to a router that's in a different continent will see how long it takes you to go through the terrestrial network. And in those cases, actually, if you bounce over satellite, it, you bypass a lot of this. All these stops, and you get a you get a you get a much faster connection. So so it's it's uh, it depends what you're looking at. You you know we can't generalize and say it's it's bad or it, it doesn't work. So every case is different. Mm -hmm. 
Um, uh, we uh, so we have another interesting question here, again uh, re relating to this uh, top topic of intersatellite links. So such questions that says, what type of intersatellite links, radio or optical, are more feasible from the technical point of view? So wh what do you think about about that? Well, the satellite to satellite links that we are looking at in the context of, of uh, WRC 23 are, are radio links. Mm -hmm. and, um, and really, the, the ones that we're looking at and studying are, are essentially going to look just like uh, additional user traffic on our satellite. So we're providing connectivity when the, the MGSO satellites are within the cone of coverage of our uh, of the, the service provider satellite, and they look almost, you know, like another VSAT or almost a, and like an ESIM as they're passing under the, 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 the host provider satellite. The types of satellites that we're, we're looking at in their ESS missions, they're looking to offload a lot of their, their Earth observation traffic. Uh, their space science missions and uh, as well as others, but, but certainly the radio links are the ones that we're looking at now in the current WRC study cycle. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much for those replies. <clears throat> There's another interesting question regarding in-flight connectivity here. So will, will, you see, will you see more consolidation between satellite operators and in-flight connectivity services? And uh, I think this is linked to one of the agenda items of the next conference. What is the key strength of KU band for in-flight connectivity? So, so, so I can speak about KU band. I think I'm the only KU operator. <laughs> so, so, uh, so, so. Well, I mean, it's it's. Uh, I think there's there's always, um, in my view, a myth about uh, the disparity between KU and KA in terms of modest spectrum. Because if you look at the and the amount of down, downlink spectrum that is available to KU, it's it's about two gigahertz of, of uh, you know of spectrum from one ten point seven to twelve point seven. So uh, so I think in the at least in the forward direction there's uh, uh, there is parity. So and then you know, on top of that you have the added advantage of, of better uh, uh, rain fade. Obviously for aero it's less of an issue, but. Um, I think there there is the there's also the legacy element of it that the number of uh, number of planes that are fitted with KU systems you know so uh, there is there is certain design elements about about uh, uh, phase array antennas in KU so I mean it's it's I don't think that we can say that one system is better than the other you know there's there's two ecosystems they have advantages and disadvantages and. Uh, and it's it's uh, you know it, it depends on on what is being offered and what's the overall system, what is the or, what's the overall value proposition, not just the you know I, th I think we 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 become so you know narrow focus when we only look at the band as the determinant of which system is better, you know yeah, I think what's important to look at is the entire system end to end. What is the what is being offered? What is the value proposition? And this is how the system. This is how you you make a better judgment. So, thank thank you very much. Uh, so another interesting question here. Uh, this is a topic we discuss in ITU. Is this uh, how how do you see uh, satellite integration into IMT? So this is one of the issues, hot issues. Uh, so IMT seems to devour spectrum in all bands at the expense of other services for example satellites how 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 do you see this integration and somehow competition with with imt i don't know who would like to take that one uh, so nelson yes um, so I, I think we look at it more as satellite integration into 5G, you know, so being part of 5G network of networks, um, you know, it's satellite systems that are going to provide um, the connectivity everywhere and uh, filling gaps, um, you know, between terrestrial networks. So you see it really is complementary and that satellites are critical to um uh, like enabling the full vision of 5G. So, I mean, 
One thing I can say that Intelsat is very active in the 3GPP group where we try to integrate the satellite component into these discussions. So, so uh, whereas before uh, satellite was thought of as, a, as something you reach out for on the shelf and then you try to make it work with, with, uh, with the mobile network, now, now we're becoming more integrated and more into the definition of, of 3GPP. So I think that's important. So we are fully integrated, you know, as a case, as a, as a, as a use case within within 3GPP. Um, so thank you. Thank you very much. So I think we still have time. One more, well, interesting question here about this uh, integration in between GEO and LEO. The question is, are large uh, GEO operators, uh, Intelsat, Imasat, and others, considering LEO constellations to augment GEO, GEO uh, networks, or GSO networks? How do you... So, yeah, so that's one that, that um, we addressed earlier and that, that uh, I think several of the operators have both uh, GSO constellations up there and then filings and, and preparatory work to support uh, LEOs or, or NEO constellations. And, uh, you know, I think it's, it's uh, a different, different type of use case when you're looking at a GSO who's got a global constellation and is looking to augment capacity with, uh, and capabilities with, uh, with an NGSO system versus uh, someone who's got a standalone NGSO system who has to make that whole system do everything because uh, each system has a little bit of their strengths. And so we can really put a lot of capacity at a very low cost per bit uh, on the ground with the GSO satellite. But there, there are some uh, things like latency and also some of the higher latitude coverages that are, are brought by the NGSOs that, that really complement the system. So there's, uh, I think there's room for, for both and, and some operators are looking at, at both. Okay. So Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. I think, well, maybe, maybe uh, one, uh, one very, very last question before closing. So this is regarding the future. I mean, <laughs> there is a question about the 6G. I mean, uh, we have not started discussing this in, in ITU. <laughs> we are still in 5G, but I don't know if uh, any any of you has uh, any plans or already thinking about uh, any uh, satellite uh, uh, development for what would be after the, the 5G, I would say. Have, have you any idea already on that or or not yet? Thank you. But maybe maybe too early, too early to 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 think to think about that. And uh, so uh, one last question, I mean regarding this mission extension vehicle is this uh, the question what, what is the average cost of a mission extension uh, vehicle mission? I will have to uh, I will have to check for you I don't, in all honesty okay. I, I don't know but uh... yeah okay so I think we're now the getting to the end of the uh, our webinar so I'll take this opportunity to thank you all very very much again for your participation for your very very interesting uh, presentations and uh, reply to all those uh, interesting questions i thank the audience for uh, following us uh, all those presentations and raising this this very very interesting questions i think uh, we learned a lot with that and uh, there's a lot of uh, work to do and uh, the studies to, to conduct as we, as I mentioned, and you all mentioned in your presentations, I mean, the, regarding the results of WC19 and all the studies that we are going to conduct uh, towards the, the, the next conference, uh, conference and the opportunities that will be uh, open uh, for all uh, those uh, developments and the innovations uh, in uh, your networks. So thank you very much once more. At this point in time, uh, I will maybe uh, call my colleague uh, 
uh, Alexander Valet, uh, the chief of the Space Service Department, just to make some announcements uh, regarding uh, future uh, events. But just before that, just to highlight one point that again, Regarding these studies, uh, as the, the director mentioned uh, in his speech, uh, lots of these, um, many of those studies are being conducted in uh, in the radio communication sector of ITU, and more specifically in ITR Study Group Four and Working Party Four A. So I just take this opportunity to invite uh, you to consider uh, participating. Uh, uh, in our or uh, becoming a member uh, of ITU to follow uh, those uh, interesting studies. So at this point in time, okay, I will ask my uh, Mr. Valet, uh, Chief of the Space Service Department, to make some announcements regarding uh, future events, future webinars, and other events uh, of, of ITUR. Thank you very much. Thank Alex. you very much, next Nelson. Um, yeah, just to mention uh, to the participants that uh, we will put uh, all the material of these uh, webinars um, online uh, in the IT web page, and I have shared the link of this web page in the chat. So we will do that in the coming days, and uh, you can already go to the page to see the material of the webinars number one and number two. Um, I would like to, to of course, uh, thank you all and just mention that we have uh, in the coming weeks uh, the World Radio Seminar happening. So uh, this uh, seminar is going to present much more in depth um, the uh, details of the satellite uh, procedures as well as terrestrial uh, aspects of spectrum management. This is also a good opportunity to learn about the functioning of ITU. Uh, for the first time ever, since we are going virtual, the uh, first week of this seminar uh, will be open to all uh, participants uh, interested. So you don't need to be an ITUR uh, or an ITU members to participate. You can freely join the first week. So it will start on the 30th of November. And I invite you to look at the, the web page on the ITU website, uh, World Radio Seminar 2020, to see the program and see what can be of interest to you. There will be two sessions per day to accommodate to, uh, different time zones. So normally, everybody should be able uh, to, to join without too much trouble. Um, the next uh, uh, event, this was the, last, the third and the last uh, webinar, uh, the ITU satellite webinar for this year. But we have received a number of requests to continue next year. So uh, we will do that. Uh, we will uh, start again uh, next year. And uh, we have already uh, think uh, we have already talked sorry about uh, some uh, uh, topics like um, IoT by satellite, also uh, something around CubeSats, maybe around uh, amateur satellites. Uh, so, um, so there are plenty of subjects, plenty of topics to address, and um, I hope that you will continue to, to join us. So it was really a pleasure for all the the Radio Communication Bureau to. Uh, to have uh, you, not only uh, the great panelists that uh, were always very keen and very supportive of this initiative, and I would like to thank them for that, but also all the attendees that uh, also contributed to the success of these uh, webinars by uh, sending many questions, many interesting questions. Uh, I know that we have not been able to answer to all of them, but um, this is unfortunately a little bit the, the, the rule of the game with these webinars. Thanks again, and uh, I hope that you will uh, join uh, the World Radio Seminar in uh, three weeks now. And, and um, I wish you a good day uh, or a good night for some. Thank you.